my intention actually isn't, I mean, this is not really about my witness testimony, but as a kind of introduction to the main talk, I, and, and also Dr. Haas kind of introduced it, so let me just spend a couple of minutes on that. Um, I, uh, I'm Jewish. Uh, I, my parents are both German Jewish Holocaust refugees. I say I'm Jewish, by the way, but I was baptized in 1992, so don't get scared that I'm like, not a member of the Catholic Church. Um, and, and in the course of the talk, it'll become clear why I'm, why I'm using the present tense when I say I'm Jewish. But anyway, uh, my parents are both German Jewish Holocaust refugees. My mother, my father left Germany right after Hitler came to power. There was a short period when the Jews were actually being encouraged to leave as long as they left everything behind. My mother's family was less fortunate. They fled to France. They were in Paris when, when Paris fell to the Nazis. And my mother was actually arrested and put on a train to a concentration camp, but escaped and made it to the United States, and where my parents met and married. And I went up, growing up, my whole world was Jewish. I was very Jewish. I was quite devout. And um, I uh, even the, the, uh, became more um, devoutly Jewish or, or more enthusiastic about, about God and, and Judaism in my high school years. And at the end of high school, I actually spent that summer living and traveling with a Hasidic rabbi. You know the Hasids? I'm sure you must have Hasidic community. Should I get closer? Yeah. Okay. Right down the street. Um, with a Hasidic rabbi in, in Israel and toyed with the idea of not um, going back to the United States and starting university in the fall, but uh, entering Jewish religious life in Israel. But I did come back. I started MIT. I lost my faith at MIT. Um, uh, in part, um, under the influence of the pseudoscientific uh, materialistic worldview that uh, religion is a medieval superstition and science has all the answers and anything that science doesn't have the answer to today, it will in five years. Um, that's a pseudoscientific view. It's not a truly scientific view because the essence of science is you start with the evidence and you draw your conclusions on the basis of the evidence. And if you have a theory that's disproved by the evidence, you have to throw away the theory and find another theory that fits the evidence. The truth is that all of the evidence is for the Catholic faith. And um, the, those who, I mean, for instance, um, I, I don't want to go too far off on this tangent, but um, there's lots of physical evidence that s strongly suggests the Catholic faith and certainly contradicts the materialistic worldview. Uh, some examples are the uh, miracle of Fatima that was witnessed by 80 to 100,000 people, including atheists and skeptics and hardcore communists who were just there to scoff and so forth. You have the medical miracles at Lourdes, which to be approved by the medical bureau there, there has to be uh, documented physical evidence before the healing, after the healing. Um, there has to be no natural explanation for the healing. It has to be permanent and so forth. Um, you know, you have, all, you have the Shroud of Turin, for which there's no scientific or no materialistic explanation. You have the Tilma of Guadalupe, for which there's no materialistic explanation. So in fact, a, sci a truly scientific viewpoint would have to throw out the materialistic worldview, right? Yes. So that's why it's actually pseudoscientific to say, and, and what this materialistic worldview does is it says, we don't care what the evidence is, it can't be true, so we're going to dismiss it. And that's the opposite of science. Uh, G.K. Chesterton has a quote, rightly or wrongly, those who believe in miracles believe in them on the basis of the evidence. And rightly or wrongly, those who disbelieve in miracles refuse to believe in them on the basis of faith. <laughs> right? So anyway, nonetheless, I lost my faith in MIT. Uh, that was all a big digression. Uh, I, after a number of years, uh, about five years designing computer languages, as Dr. Haas said, I left MIT uh, majoring in linguistics, including computational linguistics. So I designed computer languages. I went back to uh, school to go to Harvard Business School about five years later. I did well enough there that they asked me to join the faculty. So I found myself a newly minted professor of marketing at, at the ripe old age of 29. And that's really the start of where my witness testimony begins because all my life I felt there has to be a real meaning and purpose to life and someday when I'm older I'll come to know it. As a child I thought that would come from coming into a personal relationship with God, which I honestly thought would happen at my bar mitzvah, you know, when the Jewish boy turns 13 and there's a ceremony in the synagogue where he enters religious adulthood. When it didn't happen on my bar mitzvah, um, I, it was, I was crushed. But then pretty soon I thought the real meaning of life would come when I got a driver's license. 
Um, or when I left home, or if I got into MIT, or if I got into Harvard Business School, or when I started my career and so forth. But here I was already more successful in terms of secular career than I ever expected to be. You know, being this Harvard Business School professor is pretty heady stuff. But there was still no meaning or purpose to life. But there was nothing more to look forward to that could give me, that I could hope would give me a meaning and purpose to life. So I fell into this kind of existential despair. And in that despair, and I had long since stopped believing in God, I was just walking alone in nature early one morning when I received the most uh, spectacular grace of my life. From one moment to the next, the veil between earth and heaven dropped, and I found myself in the presence of God, seeing my life as though I had died and was looking back over my life in the presence of God. And I saw in an instant everything I would be happy about and everything I would wish I had done differently. I saw that when I died, my two greatest regrets would be uh, all the time and energy I had wasted worrying about not being loved when every instant of my existence I was held in an ocean of love greater than I ever imagined could exist, coming from an all-knowing, all-loving God. And the other great regret would be every hour I had wasted doing nothing of value in the eyes of heaven. Um, I saw it was all true. We live forever. Every um, uh, action has a moral content that is weighed in the scales and, and recorded for all eternity, that every uh, moment of our life has the potential for um, a, a moral action, even if it's just a prayer, that um, will essentially benefit us for all eternity in heaven. And every opportunity that we waste and not take advantage of will be an opportunity lost for all eternity. And um, I was, at the time, a, a um, professor of marketing at Harvard Business School, right? So everything was cost-benefit analysis and maximizing returns <laughs> and all of that stuff. And so I couldn't help thinking of it in those terms during this experience because I had no religious orientation. So it's not like you know, I was fitting this into the Baltimore Catechism or anything. So I realized in this you know, experience, I thought that the problem was that here all my life I had been selfish I didn't realize that was the problem. I thought the problem was all my life I had been stupidly selfish and working for things that won't matter at all 100 years from now. And if I wanted to be smart and selfish, the only thing that made sense would be to put all of my time and energy into working for things from which I would be quite literally benefiting 100 million years from now. Right? It's like I was working for monopoly money instead of gold coin. Um, so I, I left this experience. Um, I mean, my whole world had changed because I knew, I, I, I saw in this experience that everything that had ever happened to me had been the most perfect thing coming from the hands of an all-knowing, all-loving God, not only including those things that caused the most suffering at the time, but especially those things that caused the most suffering at the time. Um, I saw uh, that all my life I had been like l looking at my life in the rearview mirror saying to myself, if only that hadn't happened, then I would be happy today, or if only that hadn't happened, then I would be happy. And I saw how nothing could be further from the truth, that everything that had ever happened to me had been the most perfect thing that could have been arranged to happen to me. There was never any reason to be anxious about anything. Um, and there was certainly no reason to um, be obsessed with um, not being loved when every instant of my existence, I was watched over and loved far more than I could ever hope um, by an all-loving God who was watching over me and paying attention to me and protecting me and arranging things for me and so I were the only creature he had ever created. Um, not only had he been arranging everything that happened to me every moment of my life, but he had been aware of how I felt at every moment of my life and in some sense rejoiced with me at everything that made me happy and commiserated with me at everything that made me sad. So I went back home to Cambridge, happy for the first time since childhood, determined to do nothing but pursue this experience and find out who this God was and how to worship him. Uh, during this experience, I prayed to know this God's name. I couldn't put him together with the God of Judaism, who I know it was the God of Judaism, but if you read the Old Testament, the picture of God that emerges is of one much more distant and judgmental than this. So I prayed during this experience, let me know your name so I know what religion to follow, to worship and serve you properly. I don't mind if you're Buddha and I have to become Buddhist. I don't mind if you're Apollo and I have to become a Roman pagan. I don't mind if you're Christian and I have to become Hindu, as long as you're not Christ and I have to become Christian. <laughs> <laughs> and I literally, I literally prayed that. So he didn't tell me his name. I obviously wasn't you know, ready to hear it. But when I got back home, 
Um, every night before going to sleep, I would say a short prayer to know the name of my Lord and Master and God who had revealed himself to me, so I would know how to worship and serve him properly. And a year to the day after that initial experience, I went to sleep. I felt as though I were woken by a hand gently on my shoulder and led to a room and left alone with the most beautiful young woman I could ever imagine. I knew without being told that it was the Blessed Virgin Mary. When I found myself in her presence, all I wanted to do was throw myself on my knees and somehow honor her properly. Um, in fact, the first thought that crossed my mind was, I wish I at least knew the Hail Mary. <laughs> Uh, but I didn't. So the first thing she said to me was she offered to answer any questions I might have for her. So I wanted to ask her to teach me the Hail Mary, but I was too proud to admit I didn't know it. So the first question I asked her was, what's your favorite prayer to you? Now, her initial response was a little bit coy. She said, I love all prayers to me. But I was a bit pushy. Maybe that's because I was a New York Jew and maybe not. <laughs> but um, I said, you must love some prayers to you more than others. And, and she relented, and she recited a prayer to me, um, but it was in Portuguese, and I didn't know any Portuguese. <laughs> so all I could do was make the effort to remember the first few syllables phonetically, and the next morning when I woke up, write them down phonetically. And later, when I met a Portuguese Catholic woman, I asked her to recite all of the Marian prayers in Portuguese so I could identify it. And to the best of my ability, it was uh, identified as, O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us, have recourse to thee. Um, now, I asked her about uh, four or five other questions, and she answered them very graciously. Um, I'm, I'm, I'll mention one of those other questions now. I'll, I'll leave at least 15 minutes at the end for questions and answers, and everything's fair game, including this. So. But I'll just answer, ask, uh, mention one other question I asked her, which was more of an exclamation than a question. Um, when I found myself in her presence, I was just overwhelmed uh, number one, I was overwhelmed by the uh, love that flowed from her, which was put me in a state of ecstasy greater than I ever imagined could exist, just to feel the purity and intensity of the love coming from her. But I was also overwhelmed by her grandeur, by her gloriousness, by her exaltedness. So I just kind of stammered out, how can it be? How is it possible that you're so magnificent, that you're so exalted, that you're so glorious? How can it be? And she just looked down at me sort of pityingly, and she shook her head gently, and she said, oh, no, you don't understand. You don't understand anything. I'm nothing. I'm a created thing. I'm a creature. He's everything. So anyway, after, after the questions and answers, she said she had something she wanted to talk to me about. She spoke for about another 10 or 15 minutes. And, um, and then I went back to sleep. And when I woke up the next morning, I knew it was Christ in the initial experience. I knew who the Blessed Virgin Mary was. I knew I wanted nothing more than to be as fully and completely a Christian as possible. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know the difference between a Protestant and a Catholic. And I really couldn't do anything except open a local phone book and find a church to go to, which is a Protestant church. But when I got to know the pastor a little bit, I shyly asked him about the Blessed Virgin Mary. And when he answered without the respect that I knew was due her, and that's an understatement, um, I knew this was no place for me. And so basically, um, to cut it cut it off here, really, never mind, cut it short. Uh, knowing who the Blessed Virgin Mary was uh, led me pretty, pretty directly without too many detours into the Catholic Church. Now, when I became a Catholic, um, when I entered the church, I was always a little puzzled when cradle Catholics would come up to me and throw their arms wide and say, welcome to our church, because I couldn't help feeling that if the Catholic faith is true, it should be me who was throwing my arms wide, saying, <laughs> welcome to my church. Because um, if the Catholic faith is true, the Catholic Church is nothing but the continuation of Judaism after the coming of the Jewish Messiah. And everything about Judaism was uh, to prepare for the biggest event in, never mind human history, in creation history, which is the incarnation of God as man. And at that point, everything changed. And the, um, uh, the relationship between, the special relationship between God and man which had been restricted to the Jewish people for the purpose of making possible the Incarnation, was opened up to the whole world through the church, through the sacraments of the church, and through faith in Jesus, which was always the intention. So really, it's one and the same religion divided into two phases, right? The pre-Messianic phase, which is Judaism, and the full-blown coming to life of, of the religion, which is the Catholic Church. 
I'm going to go back and uh, uh, talk about that theology. Let me tell you my, my, my plan for the next 40 minutes, um, which is uh, in a moment or two, I'm going to go back and talk about the, that theology I was talking about, about the relationship between Judaism and the Catholic faith, the role of Judaism in bringing about the Messiah. And then I will talk about the a role of Judaism in between the first and second coming of Christ and the role of Judaism in relationship to the second coming of Christ. And using that role of Judaism between the first and second coming, look at what's going on in the world and, and uh, has recently gone on in the world and try to tie that into this kind of economy of salvation to precede the second coming. Um, so I guess I'll kind of start at the beginning. Oh, no, let me, let me take a short kind of... Um, pause here and make a little tangential uh, a little tangential discussion or mention something. Um, first of all, despite, despite my heritage, I'm not here to sell books, but you may have noticed that I do have my books downstairs. And um, I'm not, this is actually not a commercial interruption to sell books, but <laughs> you'll see how it ties in. Um, I, have, I, have, I have two books down there, Salvation is from the Jews, The Role of Judaism in Salvation History from Abraham to Second Coming. That's the theology that I'm going to be talking about. The other book is Honey from the Rock, 16 Jews Find the Sweetness of Christ, which is 16 Jewish Catholic witness testimonies. Um, now, most of the conversions in there are miraculous, uh, like, sort of like mine. Uh, ap- the only church-approved apparition of the Blessed Virgin Mary in Rome, in the city of Rome to this day, for instance, was when she appeared to a virulently anti-Catholic, um, atheistic Jewish man in the middle of the 19th century, Alphonse Radisbone, in a church in San Andrea della Frade. And he instantly um, uh, fell to his knees weeping. He, he received the grace of seeing the horribleness of sin and of original sin and his actual sin. And as soon as he regained his voice, the first words he stammered out um, to his friend who had brought him there, was uh, take me to a priest. I have to be baptized right away. Um, so um, anyway, so but the reason I'm bringing this up is because I want to read a couple of quotes from other Jews who have entered the Catholic Church just to underline this sense that the Catholic Church is the continuation and fulfillment of Judaism. And it's not a rupture. It's not a change. God forbid. It's not a different and distinct religion. It is the fulfillment of the same religion. So anyway... A couple of quotes. Um, uh, cardinal Archbishop Lustiger, who was the Cardinal Archbishop of Paris until he died about eight years ago now, he was also a Jewish convert. And uh, here's a quote from him. Uh, I explained to my father that baptism would not make me abandon my Jewish condition. Quite the contrary. It would lead me to find it to receive the fullness of its meaning. I did not have the feeling that I was betraying my heritage or abandoning anything whatsoever. Just the opposite. I felt I was going to find the import, the meaning of what I had received at birth. I did nothing more than begin to enjoy the heritage that had been promised to me. Now, all of these sentiments are shared by every Jew I have ever read about or met who has entered the Catholic Church. Uh, I'll just read one other. Um, He's kind of a personal hero of mine because he was a Hasidic Jew, Charlie Rich. By the way, um, this is a non-commercial introduction. These are prayer cards I had made up uh, I have, I'll have them downstairs. Uh, they're for free. See, I'm at least half converted. Um, <laughs> um, and they have pictures of, of Jewish Catholics on the front, and on the back they have quotes from them and prayers for the conversion of the Jews. So this is Charlie Rich, who was a Hasidic Jew in New York. Um, he tried to commit suicide several times when he lost his faith. Life had no meaning. Um, and, uh, and this is what he wrote after his, um, after his baptism. Uh, It would have been in vain to have been born had God not been good enough to extend me the grace to become a member of the mystical body of Christ that the Church of Rome is. Without the life Christ is, there is no life at all. It is for heaven we have been made and for no other earthly good thing. I became a Catholic so that I may in that way be happy, not just for a few years, but forever and ever. I became a Catholic so that I may in that way get the grace to one day participate in the joys of the angels and saints in the life to come. One can never come to an end of enumerating the blessings conferred upon one by the grace of being a Catholic. Can the mercy of God be made more manifest than in the grace extended to us to become a member of the only true church? 
It is being a Catholic that matters and not any other thing the world has to offer, however good and beautiful it may be. The Church of Rome gives us God himself. It does so in all his fullness. A greater gift than God is a human being cannot hope to receive. We receive the gift God himself is when we receive Holy Communion. To become more intimately united with God than the Church enables us to be by means of the Holy Sacraments, we must take leave of this life. Right? Which is really just Catholicism 101, so to speak. Um, the, by the way, uh, after his... his, his uh, okay, I, I, I'm sorry. I'll tell his story in like two minutes. It's a very cute story. He tried to commit suicide a number of times. One time, he was living on a walk up on the Lower East Side, which was the Jewish ghetto in New York at the time, with his mother. And um, one day, uh, he, I mean, he was, he tried to, as I said, about three times tried to kill himself. One of the times, he picked up rat poison at a hardware store, and he uh, was walking home. He came home with his paper bag of, with rat poison in it, planning to go up to his room and take the rat poison and kill himself, because life had no meaning, right, without God. So uh, he walks into the, the, his apartment, and his mother's in the kitchen, and um, he's on his way to his bedroom, but his mother calls out, Charlie, Charlie, come into the kitchen. I just made some bagels for you. Have a bagel. So he figures, what the heck, I might as well make her happy. I'm about to kill myself. <laughs> so, so he goes in the kitchen and has a bagel, and she says, you know, Charlie, Charlie, have another one. I made them just for you. So he figured, why not, right? So he has a second bagel, and then he goes in his bedroom, takes the rat poison, and lies down on his bed to die. And he wakes up violently ill a couple of hours later. It turns out that the baking soda in the, used as leavening in the bagel was an antidote to the rat poison. So anyway, so anyway his conversion came about. Um, he was walking around New York City after another unsuccessful suicide attempt trying to uh, hang himself. When it was, it was like an August day, this is the late 50s, it's before there's air conditioning, and the only cool places were empty churches, right? Dark churches. So he walks into this empty Catholic church just to get out of the heat and sit down. He sits down under a stained glass window of Jesus stilling the waters. He looks up at the picture, and he says to himself, if only it were true, and he hears this voice say, it is all true. <laughs> And he, felt, he, he instantly received the grace of faith. He fell on his knees, again weeping, and um, almost immediately went um, to a, a Jesuit priest at Fordham to ask him to baptize him. And in those days, the Jesuits were willing to. That's another story, but <laughs> I had some problems in that direction. But anyway, in that department. So, and he entered the Catholic Church. He uh, tried to find a place in religious life for a number of years, but was turned down by all these religious communities. And uh, he ended up living with the Jesuits in New York City as a contemplative, living with them, but never becoming a member of, of the, uh, formerly of the community, as a contemplative, praying before the Blessed Sacrament exposed 12 to 14 hours a day for the rest of his life. And he died in 1998 at the age of 99. Um, so anyway, so... Um, that was all kind of a digression. But if I didn't talk a little about these converts, I'd never sell any copies of this book. Right? <laughs> so anyway, let me get back to the theology. And um, actually, I'll start at the beginning, because the story really begins at the very beginning of the Garden of Eden, right? When God originally created man, he created him to live in a state of uninterrupted intimacy with God and bliss from his creation for all eternity. When man chose sin, that initial relationship between God and man was ruptured, and man fell. But God knew at that very moment, actually before that very moment, that someday he would not only restore man to that initial intimacy with God, but to an even higher state through the incarnation of the second person of the Most Holy Trinity as a man at some future point in time. Now, if the second person of the Most Holy Trinity was going to incarnate as a man at some future point in time, it would be among a particular people, in a particular spot in the world, uh, at a particular point in time, even in the womb of a particular virgin, and of course that people would have to be prepared. They would have to be separated out from all the other people on the earth. They would have to be taught about the one true God, about the seriousness of sin, about the uh, need for redemption, about the future coming of a redeemer. They would have to be given enough divine revelation to identify the redeemer when he came, and they would have to be given enough revelation uh, to pr provide a foundation of theology that would allow them to make sense of what was happening and to spread the gospel to the four corners of the earth after the incarnation took place. 
And that's what the Jewish people were, right? They were chosen, one could say, at, almost at random from all the people on the face of the earth to host the incarnation of God as man 2,000 years in the future from that point in time. Now, and also, by the way, as a little bit of a digression, if they were going to be chosen, separated out, and given this divine revelation over 2,000 years, they would have to be given mechanisms to stay separate for 2,000 years, right? While all these tribes were slaughtering each other and intermingling and intermarrying. And you can look at the history of the Jews, you can look at the restrictions of Judaism given in the Old Testament, and you can say, hmm, these laws given to the Jews in the Old Testament did a pretty good job of ensuring that they would stay separate for 2,000 years until the Messiah came. You can even look at some characteristics of the Jewish people and wonder whether God might have put those characteristics in the people to enable them to stay separate. Right? As, as it's not me, St. Stephen said, right? you've always been a hard-hearted and stiff-necked people, right? slow to believe the prophets. But all of those traits, which uh, resulted in some sense in their condemnation at the time of Jesus, were traits which served them well for 2,000 years to keep them separate and to maintain their ethnic identity. So anyway, that is, in a nutshell, in some sense you could say, the story of the Jews' role in salvation history in between the creation of man and the coming of Christ. Now, that opens the question, okay, what about after the coming of Christ? Did they exhaust their role in salvation history when the, when, in bringing about the incarnation, or did they still have a role in salvation uh, for the period in between the first and second coming of Christ? Now, we know from three sources that they, did have, they, they do have a role in salvation history between the first and second coming of Christ. Um, we know it from a scripture, we know it from history, and as Catholics, we know it from the catechism of the Catholic Church. Um, so let me, let me go into that a little bit. Um, we, know, we know that... Um, um, we, I'm just trying to decide where to best spend my time. Um, um, we know, for one thing, that there will be Jews around until this time of the Second Coming, and we know there will be a conversion of the Jews to precede the Second Coming. Paragraph 678 of the New Catechism of the Catholic Church says, quote, the glorious Messiah's coming is suspended at every moment of history until his recognition by all Israel. Okay? It, um, let me repeat that. The glorious Messiah's coming is suspended at every moment of history until his recognition by all Israel. The second coming has to be preceded by the conversion of the Jews, his recognition by all Israel. That paragraph in the Catechism references uh, two passages of Scripture, um, you know, in the, in, the, in the footnotes to it. Um, it references um, Romans 11. Um, now, let me read the passage. Because this is really, Romans 11 is, is the mother load of theology about the role of the Jews in between the first and second coming of Christ. And at the end of my talk, I'll go back to Romans 11 at more length. But let me just read a couple of lines from it now. Uh, quote, uh, Israel failed to obtain what it sought. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a st spirit of stupor, eyes that should not see and ears that should not hear, down to this very day. Let their eyes be darkened so they cannot see. Okay, so the failure of the Jews to recognize Christ wasn't only due to their own stubbornness and hard-heartedness, but as Paul says, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that should not see and ears that should not hear, down to this very day. Let their eyes be darkened so they cannot see. And then Paul goes on, I want you to understand this mystery, brethren. A hardening has come upon part of Israel until the full number of the Gentiles come in, and so all Israel will be saved. Okay? So this veil has been cast over the eyes of the Jews, quote, until the full number of the Gentiles come in, and then all Israel will be saved. Now, what's this business of the full number of the Gentiles coming in? We know more about that from the words of Jesus himself. In, um, in, in um, uh, Luke chapter 21, shortly before his crucifixion, Jesus is prophesying over Jerusalem, and he says, quote, the Jews will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all nations, and Jerusalem will be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So that you have that same thought, right? Until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And then Jesus goes on and says, And there will be signs in sun and moon and stars, and upon the earth distress of nations and perplexity, 
at the roaring of the sea and the waves, men fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Okay? So let me go through that. Jesus is laying out a timeline, right? He says the Jews will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all nations. Literally fulfilled in 70 AD, right? The, the temple was destroyed. The Romans took Jerusalem. The Jews were led away at the point of the sword into slavery, dispersed among all nations. The Jesus goes on to say, and Jerusalem will be trodden down by the Gentiles. Literally fulfilled, Jerusalem was in Gentile hands uh, continuously from that point on until 1967 AD, when for the first time in almost 2,000 years, the old city of Jerusalem returned to Jewish hands. And then Jesus immediately goes into, well, first of all, then he says, until, uh, Jew, Jerusalem will be trodden down by the Gentiles, and then until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So he's kind of making an equation of Jerusalem returning to the hands of the Jews with the times of the Gentiles being fulfilled. And then Jesus immediately goes into the description of the second coming, right? Signs and sun and moon and stars, and upon the earth distress of men and perplexity of the roaring of the sea and the waves, uh, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Right? So he's laying out this timeline. Uh, fall of Jerusalem, dispersal of the Jews, return of Jerusalem to Jewish hands, the times of the Gentiles being fulfilled, then the upheaval to precede the second coming and the second coming. Um, wow. Okay. So um, the... Um, the third, the third indication we have of the role, that there's a role of the Jews to play in salvation history in between the first and second coming comes from the history of the last 2,000 years. Because, in fact, I will argue that the fact that the Jews still exist as an identifiable people is in itself a miracle and unprecedented in human history. And I'll read a quote from Benedict, by the way, in a moment, where he says exactly the same thing. And um, we have two aspects of um, the history of the last 2,000 years that suggests a continuing role of the Jews to play in salvation history. One is their continued existence. I mean, you read the Old Testament's full of the Hittites and the Amorites and the Jebusites and the Canaanites and so forth, you know, all more numerous and powerful than the Jews, but you know, none of them are around anymore. And the other aspect of this mysterious history is, in fact, anti-Semitism itself, the animosity the um, hostility directed towards the Jews almost continuously for the last 2,000 years. I mean, most ethnic groups have been hated by someone else somewhere in the world at some point in time, but not a lot have been hated everywhere in the world by everyone they've been among at every point in time. <laughs> so, um, uh, and actually, um, Cardinal Lustiger says in his, in his, um, auto, there's a, uh, in his autobiographical book, uh, cho choosing God, chosen by God, that the, uh, basically anti-Semitism itself is, a, is an indication of the Jews' continuing role in salvation history. But I don't have that quote word for word. But I do have Benedict's quote word for word, so let me read that. Um, this, okay, for, is, this is from his book, um, God and the World, which is a uh, book-length interview. So let me first read the interviewer's question to Benedict. It's, quote, Although the Jews have lived 2,000 years in exile, their religion has not evaporated. This is a phenomenon without parallel in the history of mankind. My question is whether the development of the world as a whole has not some mysterious connection with the Jewish people. Benedict's answer. That actually seems to me to be quite obvious, that this tiny people who no longer had any country, any independent existence, but led their life scattered throughout the world and kept their own identity, that the way the Jews are still Jews and still a people, even during these 2,000 years when they had no country, is an absolute riddle. This phenomenon in itself shows us that something else is at work here. You can see in this way that there is something more than mere historical chance at work. The great powers of that period have all disappeared, yet Israel remains. It is quite obvious that the Jews have something to do with God and that God has not abandoned them. Uh, hand in hand with this belief goes another, that Israel still has a mission to accomplish today. Uh, we know that while history runs its course, even this standing at the door, in other words, the, Israel's failure to uh, accept Christ, fulfills a mission, one that is important for the world. In that way, this people still has a special place in God's plan. That's from God and the world. 
I, I, I kind of compressed that quote, so um, that's why the syntax didn't quite work. But I just want to give evidence that this isn't just my Michigas, excuse the expression, <laughs> but it's, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, you know it's, it echoes the words of, of Pope Benedict. So let me just touch on um, this, this aspect of um, what anti-Semitism tells us about the Jews' continuing role in salvation history. Um, let me actually um, get at that by talking about the two most virulent um, illustrations or examples of anti-Semitism in more or less our time, and that is uh, Nazi Germany, the Holocaust, and the attempt to exterminate the Jews, and um, frankly, Islam's theological and, uh, uh, in some sense, politically implemented hatred of the Jews. Let me start with the Holocaust. Now, we are, um, I mean, we know from what happened in the newspapers, you know, over Holy Week, I mean, we're living in a period of incredible, you know, mass media attacks on the church and on the faith and, and on the Vatican and so forth. And one of those attacks has been that somehow the Holocaust in Nazi Germany and, you know, the uh, Pope Pius XII was sympathetic or he wasn't, you know, didn't do enough to save the Jews and so forth and that he was kind of secretly sympathetic with the Nazis or actually in some of the accusations not so secretly sympathetic. Uh, there's plenty of historical evidence that that's totally untrue. I, I mean, I don't have time to go into that, but, you know, there, there are good Catholic sources. I mean, it's, it's ludicrous. Uh, and right after the war, the entire Jewish world was unanimous in his praises of Pope Pius XII as the only voice that spoke out forcibly against Nazi Germany and, and um, a cabinet men, member, a cabinet minister of Israel, Pinkas Lapidus, wrote a book where he said that uh, by his estimates, Pope Pius XII was personally responsible for saving between 750 and 800,000 Jewish lives and so forth. So this is all one big calumny, but part of that calumny is that somehow Nazism was based on Christianity. If you look at uh, the forces that flowed into uh, the Third Reich and flowed into Nazism, you can see they're the opposite of Christianity. They're all directly diabolical. Um, and it's important to look at these for a moment because we see those same three streams that flowed into the Holocaust emerging today from, the very, of course, the very same diabolical source. Those three streams that flowed into the Holocaust were occultism or Satanism, sexual depravity, and um, eugenics. And it's very spooky when you look at some of those details and, and then you look at contemporary you know, history. First of all, occultism or Satanism. Um, Hitler's first springboard to public uh, prominence was an occult society in Munich called the Thule Society, T-H-U-L-E. Uh, Thule was the Germanic version of the Atlantis myth. You've heard of the Atlantis myth from the New Age? Atlantis was supposedly a continent in the Atlantic Ocean where the people were highly developed and had these superpowers, could travel through the air and mental telepathy and so forth. This uh, continent sank beneath the waves of the Atlantic, but before it sank, the super race fled to the mainland, uh, Europe, and from there some into Asia, and they intermingled, interbred with inferior races and lost their superpowers. But if the purity of their bloodlines could be restored by selective breeding, they would regain their superpowers. This is the source of the Nazi Superman myth, of the Aryan blood supremacy, of all of the attempts to restore the purity of the Aryan bloodline so they would regain these superpowers which they had lost when they fled from Atlantis or Thule, as it is in the Germanic myth, and interbred with the inferior races. And this Thule society, named exactly after this myth, which they didn't take as a myth but took as genuine history, was uh, Hitler's first springboard to public prominence. He was a member of it. He was obviously an occultist. Um, no less of an authority than the chief exorcist of Rome, Father Gabriel Amorth, said, quote, Hitler was without a doubt personally consecrated to Satan. Um, the head of the Thule Society in Hitler's day was a occultist named Dietrich Eckhart, who boasted, quote, I have the quote, give me a moment, who boasted, um, I have, uh, about Hitler, I have initiated Hitler into the secret doctrine opened his centers of vision, and given him the means to communicate with the powers. Now, what's initiation? From the point of view of the occultists, initiation is opening their centers of higher vision inside themselves so they can communicate with the spiritual world. What it is, in fact, is the introduction of demonic entities into the person 
who then do open, in some sense, centers of um, higher perception in the person so they can communicate with the spiritual world. But it, excuse the pun, sure as hell isn't the unfallen spiritual world. It's the demonic world. And this head of the Thule Society boasted he initiated Hitler, opened his centers of vision, and given him the means to communicate with the powers. Those powers were clearly the demonic powers. Um, I, I won't go on with that, but uh, the, the Third Reich was totally permeated with occultism. The SS was set up as an occult brotherhood. Himmler was never without his copy of the Bhagavad Gita, which is the Hindu scriptures on him. Uh, Himmler th uh, was convinced he was the reincarnation of a 10th century German king, and he used to commune with this 10th century German king to get his orders. Uh, initiation into the SS had uh, occult initiation rites. Uh, the S uh, it's just, anyway, it's, I'm, I'm sorry, it's, again, it's not commercial, but it's all in the book. There's, you know, like a, a hundred pages on this. But I got to go on because I, you know, I got 17 minutes. So uh, another stream, I'm going to mention this now because I see that the youngest member of our audience has temporarily stepped out. I don't know if he was sent out or not, but uh, I'll take advantage of it. And uh, sexual depravity, and I won't spend too much time on it, but... Um, um, how can I put this? Um, the, third, the, the Holocaust, the Third Reich, what the Nazis did was totally dependent on sexual depravity because, because to essentially dull the conscience to that degree, to get people to behave as bestially as they had to behave to be SS men or concentration camp guards or something, they had to be coarsened by being you know, drawn deeply into mortal sin. Now, um, an official of the Berlin Sex Research Institute at the time of Hitler's rise to power, Ludwig Lenz uh, said, quote, over 90% of the early Nazis were homosexual. The um, Ernst Röhm, who was the head of the brown shirts, um, who bullied, you know, the irregular army, who bullied Hitler's way into power, he was a um, overt homosexual. The brown shirts themselves were started after World War I as a oh, uh, explicitly homosexual unit of, I apologize for not being able to, not knowing German, but of the uh, Freikorps, of, the, uh, of the, this kind of irregular army made up of discharged World War I veterans who had no jobs and just kind of, you know, um, formed that way. Um, the original, the first meeting place of the um, stormtroopers, um, high command was a permanently reserved table at the largest gay bar in Munich, the Bratwurstkorkel Tavern. Um, Hitler had released from prison a convicted pederast named Balder von Schirach to be the head of the Hitler Youth. People, never mind, but people yell at the Catholic Church for, you know, being tolerant to pedophilia, you know, never mind. But, um, I mean, imagine that. Um, when I discovered this, I mentioned to my father, I thought this was like, you know, rocket science, and he just looked at me funny and said, what do you mean? We all knew that. I mean, because, you know, he, he grew up in Germany. He said, you know, everyone knew that the Nazis were homosexual. Um, the, um, the newspapers would carry these articles warning parents, don't let your sons get essentially initiated into this, in the Hitler Youth. Don't let your sons enter the Hitler Youth and get initiated in this way. Anyway, I will move off that for obvious reasons. Welcome back. Um, <laughs> and go on to the third uh, leg of these diabolical forces straight from hell that led into the Holocaust, and which we're embracing, of course, today, which is one reason I'm talking about this. Um, and that third leg is eugenics. Now, uh, Hitler was um, named Chancellor of Germany January 30th, 1933. Within a few weeks, he set up the... Um, uh, let me find the, the name here in my notes. The um, Expert Committee on Questions of Population and Racial Policy to develop a eugenics program. Um, they, a few months later, passed a law calling for the compulsory sterilization of carriers of hereditary diseases, which is defined as including feeble-mindedness, alcoholism, and epilepsy, under which program about 400,000 people were forcibly sterilized. The, um, they instituted a program to euthanize disabled children um, at birth. Uh, the, the doctor or midwife had to check off one of two boxes, whether the child should be allowed to live or should be put to death, under which program over a quarter million um, children were, were killed at birth. And there was a continual flowing back 
between um, Hitler's eugenics institute and experts and Margaret Sanger's birth control league. Um, they were one and the same group of experts, group of policies, philosophy, programs, and so forth. The director of the primary German eugenics institute, the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Genealogy in Munich, was a Dr. Ernst Rudin, who was a frequent contributor to Margaret Sanger's birth control review. You know that the birth control league was just renamed plain, Planned Parenthood at a certain point in time. You know, it's the same organization. Um, a Sanger board member named Lothrop Stoddard had written a book in 1920 called The Rising Tide of Color Against White World Supremacy. It was an overtly racist eugenics text that was used as the primary eugenics text in the German school system, so much so that Goebbels complained to Hitler that it was inappropriate that a foreigner's text should be used as the basis of the German eugenics program. And that foreigner who wrote that text was a Margaret Sanger birth control member. Margaret Sanger herself, in her birth control review in April 1932, published, a plan, uh, published an article called Plan for Peace. It was her plan for world peace. And let me read a couple of bullet points from her plan for world peace. One, to apply a stern and rigid policy of sterilization and segregation to that grade of population whose progeny is tainted or whose inheritance is such that objectionable traits may be transmitted to offspring. Two, to give certain genetically undesirable groups in our population their choice of segregation or sterilization. Three, to apportion farmlands and homesteads for these segregated persons where they would be taught to work under competent instructors for the period of their entire lives, with the future citizens safeguarded from hereditary taints, with five million mental and moral degenerates segregated, with 10 million and 10, well, anyway, we could then turn our attention to the basic needs for international peace. In other words, concentration camps. In other words, take everyone that she thought was genetically inferior and give them the choice of being sterilized or working on a concentration camp for the rest of their lives so they wouldn't be able to reproduce. I mean, the, the, the equivalence between basically Margaret Sanger and what she was proposing in those days and the Third Reich programs is, is inescapable. Um, so basically, okay, let me get back to kind of the main, the main thrust of what I'm talking about, which is, which is I, I basically I have two reasons for bringing that up. One is because of the times we are living in, and the other is because it leads one to ask oneself, why should the devil be so intent on exterminating the Jews, which was uh, the, you know, such a main thrust of the Holocaust, if the Jews no longer have a role to play in salvation history, if they're irrelevant? Isn't it plausible to think that the devil's attempt to exterminate the Jews was because they do have a role to play in salvation history, and if there were no Jews around, that unfolding of salvation history could be aborted? And the devil certainly knows scripture. We, we know that from the temptation, Jesus' temptation in the desert. So maybe the devil uh, was, his plan was if there are no Jews around and there's no conversion of the Jews, there can be no second coming. Now, let me just in about five, for, for about five minutes, touch on another element here, uh, which is Islam. And in fact, there was a tremendous uh, interplay between Islam and the Third Reich. For instance, the chief mufti of Jerusalem, um, uh, the um, Haj Amin al-Husseini, had to leave the Middle East, he had to flee the Middle East because he tried to stage a pro-Nazi coup in Iraq, which failed. He fled to Germany. He was put up in Berlin as a personal guest of Hitler, given a salary of uh, 20,000 US dollars a month, which was incredible in those days. He set up an all-Muslim unit, a division of the SS called the Hanjar, uh, who were all Muslim, who destroyed uh, most of the uh, Christian churches in, in Bosnia. He was on the radio every week on uh, you know, Nazi German radio, exhorting Muslims to um, take up the fight to exterminate the Jews. He, he, his condition for cooperating with Hitler was to be given permission to exterminate all of the Jews in, um, in Palestine when Hitler won that part of the world, and he was given that permission, and so forth and so on. And in fact, one would think that if, if the Nazis were serious about racial purity, they should have been uh, prejudiced against the Arabs also. But in fact, they embraced Muslims as Aryans. And I'm not asking 
don't ask me to explain that, the logic of that, because I can't find any logic to that, except, of course, that they were answering to the same master. Now, um, uh, let, me, uh, let me explain that a little bit, which is, I'm, I'm really sorry. What seems to be confusion is really trying to get this into you know, an hour or so. So forgive me for the jumping around, but I, I don't want to. I don't want to lose a, a necessary block. Okay, good. So, um, the um, this, Islam is unique in world religions. It's very interesting to look at Islam because Islam is the only major world religion which came about after Christianity, purportedly as a result of divine revelation, and which contradicts Christianity. Right. The other world religions, by and large, came about before Christianity. The way God worked with mankind was different before Christianity. The role of revelation between God and man, and between the whole spiritual world, including the fallen spiritual world and man, was different before the incarnation of Christ. Um, but but um, Islam came about as a result of divine revelation to Muhammad right, in, uh, around the uh, late 6th you know, sixth century, seventh century, and um, he received this. He went into a cave. He received this revelation from who he was told was the angel Gabriel. Um, it was written down, you know, as the Quran. What he said was written down in this uh, secondary Islamic scriptures called the Hadith. And this divine revelation directly contradicts Christianity. It says, um, I mean, the, the the contradiction is is overt. Um, it says, for instance, it denies that Jesus died on the cross. Um, it, um, it, uh, I'll just read uh, like three verses to give an illustration. From the Quran, uh, chapter 4, um, quote, They declared, We have put to death the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, the apostle of God. They did not kill him, nor did they crucify him. They only thought they did. They certainly did not slay him. The teaching in Islam is that Jesus did not truly die on the cross. It was... It was just a kind of um, a, uh, um, what's the word, a, a kind of a, a, an illusion that was produced. And somebody else died on the cross. Um, uh, the uh, Quran, chapter 4, uh, verses 44 to 51, says, quote, um, Allah does not forgive that a partner should be ascribed unto him. Whoever ascribes partners to Allah has indeed invented a tremendous sin. This is a reference to the Trinity. Um, in uh, verse 171 of the same chapter, it says, quote, People of the scripture, do not exaggerate in your religion or utter anything concerning Allah except the truth. The Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, was only a messenger of Allah. So believe in Allah and his messengers, but do not say three. Cease. It is better for you. Allah is only one Allah. Far is it removed from his transcendent majesty that he should have a son. Okay, so these are ab absolute direct bullseyes at Christianity, denying Christianity, right? So there, there can be no question that the source of the revelation that came to Muhammad was God or was the angel Gabriel. There are three, only three logical possibilities. One is that, um, I'm talking about the first logical possibilities. The source of the revelation was God, that there was no revelation at all and the, the Islam is of human origin, or that the source of the revelation, that there was revelation, but it wasn't coming from God, it was coming from fallen spirits who were pretending to be God. Now, as Christians, we can't possibly believe that it came from God because it directly contradicts Christianity. Um, I will argue that it's implausible that it was of human origin if you look at the biography of Muhammad, the history of Muhammad, who he was. He was illiterate, he was unschooled. The Quran is very lofty Arabic poetry and prose far beyond what he could have come up with on his own. Even the theology in the Quran is far beyond anything one could have expected him to know on his own. The third possibility, that it is in fact a diabolical revelation pretending to be divine revelation, uh, to me seems you know, conclusive. Now, everywhere you look in Islam, you see a... Um, first of all, let me just make two little um, uh, softenings. One is, if what I'm saying is true, Muslims are the primary victims of Islam, right? I mean, in other words, they're not the culprits, they're the victims. Um, so this has nothing to do with Muslims or how precious their souls are to God 
or how much God wants them to see, to see them in heaven or anything like that. I mean, they've, they've been horribly, if this is true, they've been horribly duped and sort of like tempted very strongly into this false path, but it's not a condemnation of them in any sense. Um, the other thing is, everything I'm saying is from above coming down. It's the downward direction. The source of the revelation, I'm arguing, is the devil. That doesn't mean that when the individual Muslim prays to Allah, he's praying to the devil. We don't know that, right? What's coming up from the human soul you know, is a mystery that is not determined by the source of the revelation behind the Koran. Okay? So you, one has to make those two distinctions, I mean, those you know, kind of two things clear, or else, I mean, it would be horrible to think that every devout, well-meaning Muslim, when he prays, is praying to Satan. I mean, if, if his heart's in the right place, it could, it could easily be to God. However, that doesn't change the fact that the source of the revelation, it seems to me, is, is, is extremely tainted, to say the least. Now, everywhere you look in Islam, you see what looks like exactly what you'd expect, Satan's aping of Christianity. You know, God wants nothing but love from human beings. Uh, Allah wants nothing but submission. A Christianity elevates free will and, and, and the free giving of love to God you know, as the point of everything, you know, the point of all of existence. And um, Islam has zero respect for free will and zero respect for love. Allah couldn't care less if mankind loves him, and Allah couldn't care less about free will. An example of that is um, you are for life a Muslim if you recite the necessary phrase, even if you're reciting it totally against your will because somebody is holding quite literally a sword over your neck, saying, recite these words or I'll chop off your head. If you say them, you are as much a Muslim as any other Muslim in the world for the rest of your life. Free will, your intention, totally irrelevant to the process of becoming a Muslim. And the, um, everywhere you look is really interesting, and, and I wish that John had invited me to give three one-hour talks, but he didn't. But everywhere you look, marriage in Islam versus marriage in Christianity, um, the love between man and woman in Islam, the man, love between man and woman in, in Christianity, lost, love versus lust in Islam, love versus lust in Christianity. Everywhere, it's this mirror image. But I'll, I only have time to mention one mirror image, which is, as I've been saying early in this talk, the second coming can't happen until there's a conversion of the Jews. And in Islam, the second coming can't happen, the day of resurrection can't happen until the Jews are exterminated. So you see, again, a very precise um, uh, caricature of, um, of Christianity. And let me read that, um, let me read that uh, verse, if I can find it here. Um, uh, here it is. The day of resurrection will not arrive until the Muslims make war against the Jews and kill them, and until a Jew hiding behind a rock and tree, the rock and tree will say, O Muslim, O servant of Allah, there's a Jew behind me, come and kill him. And Ahmadinejad, you know, in Iran, uh, explicitly talks about this, that, you know, that they, basically he's working for, the second, working for the second coming. He's working for the day of resurrection, and he knows perfectly well that the Muslims have to wage war against the Jews and exterminate the Jews for the day of resurrection to come. And he talks about this in his speeches. I mean, it's not, uh, anyway, it's, it's, it's not speculative at all. So again, um, this, uh, I'm, I'm kind of gonna, I'm gonna finish up. Um, the, um, I think that what we see in, in happening in recent times and in the current times could easily suggest that things are kind of coming to a head. We, uh, one of the things that have, are characterizing the last 50 years in the present times is this, um, first the Holocaust, and now this, um, this Islam-based push, in some sense, to exterminate the Jews. We, um, we, we have that line about the um, Jerusalem will be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled and Jerusalem is no longer trodden down by the Gentiles. And um, so I'm just going to go back to Romans 11. I'm totally lost right now. So I'll go back to Romans 11, back to the theology, and, and just basically tie it up with Romans 11. So um, let me just... Um, 
go back to Romans 11 and read some verses, because Romans 11 explains why God arranged salvation history this way. In other words, it explains the interplay between Jew and Gentile in the period before the, between the first and second coming of Christ. So um, let me just start at the beginning and read some verses and talk about them. Um, starting at the beginning of, of uh, chapter 11, this is St. Paul speaking, of course. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Okay, so the election of the Jews somehow mysteriously continues. Paul goes on, what then? Israel failed to obtain what it sought. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened, as it is written. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that should not see and ears that should not hear, down to this very day. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see. I talked about this earlier. The blindness of the Jews, their failure to recognize Christ wasn't only due to their stubbornness, but was a mysterious part of divine providence. Paul goes on and starts to talk about why God blinded them, why God veiled their eyes. So Paul says, So I ask, have they stumbled so as to fall? By no means. Through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Okay? Through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Salvation could not have flowed properly to the Gentiles if the Jews had all followed Christ. Let me continue with Paul, and he'll explain why this is the case. Uh, Paul continues, Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? For they, if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? So let me go back to that. Their, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Um, their trespass meant riches for the world, and their failure meant riches for the Gentiles. What's Paul talking about? You see, if you read the book of Acts, the very first church council... I don't have... Well, anyway, the very first church... I'd love to ask... Anyone know what the first church council was, when it was, and what it was called to determine? And what was the question that it had to determine? Right, and circumcision was another way of asking the question, do you have to be Jewish to enter the church? Right, that's what was going on there. In other words, the mistake that the early church was wrestling with was, do you have to be Jewish to even qualify to be a Christian? Or can we allow Gentiles in if they don't first become Jewish? Circumcision, of course, being the act by which they would first become Jewish if they were men. Right? So the question was, is Christianity only for Jews? Or is it also for Gentiles? Now, this danger, you can see where it came from, because Jesus was Jewish, all of the apostles were Jewish, the 3,000 people who converted at Pentecost were all Jewish. Um, it certainly looked like Judaism, I mean, Christianity was for Jews. That danger was um, stopped in its tracks by the Jews' failure to enter the church. Because pretty soon, everyone entering the church were Gentiles, and pretty soon, the church was visibly Gentile, and no one could any longer make the mistake that, you know, this is first and foremost for Jews. But imagine what would have happened if all of the five million Jews around the Holy Land in those days had entered the church. It would have been all that much harder for, you know, first of all, to realize that the church was also for Gentiles, but even if it was also for Gentiles, it would have looked like Gentiles were second-class citizens in the church, and speaking as a Jew, the Jews would have certainly been sure that Gentiles were at best second-class citizens in the church. But that, all that was avoided by the Jews' failure to enter the church, right? So what St. Paul is saying is, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles. But if their trespass meant riches for the world, and if their failure meant riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? In other words, if their rejection of Christ was a gift to the church, how much more of a gift to the church will their acceptance of Christ be? Right? Because, it's, as Paul said, if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, the reconciliation of the Gentile world to God through the church, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? Now, this life from the dead, I can't help but put together with the dogma of the great apostasy. You've heard of the dogma of the great apostasy? The, the Catechism of the Council of Trent says that there will be three signs which must precede the second coming. And one of them is called the great apostasy, a widespread falling away from the faith. Um, and this, this, dog, this dogma, actually, is based in part on Jesus' words when he says, um, when the Son of Man returns, will he even find faith left on the face of the earth? For if men do this when the wood is green, what will they be like when the wood is dry? And so this, um, 
when Paul says, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? In, in the images in my mind, this flows into the teaching of the, about the great apostasy, the wood being dead, and the Jews flowing into the church just before the second coming, being the final revitalizing force that completes the church and prepares it for the second coming. Now, uh, let me just read the, the next passage from uh, the Romans, which is his image of the olive tree, which is his central metaphor describing the impl- interplay between Jew and Gentile in the church between the first and second coming. Uh, St. Paul says, If the root is holy, so are the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, a wild olive shoot, were grafted in their place to share the richness of the olive tree, do not boast over the branches. If you do boast, remember, it is not you that support the root, but the root that supports you. You will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. But even the others, if they do not persist in their unbelief, will be grafted in again, for God has the power to graft them in again. For if you have been cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary by, to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these natural branches be grafted back into their own olive tree? Okay? So you have this image that St. Paul is presenting of like the olive tree of salvation, and the roots are in Judaism, and, but some branches were broken off, those are the Jews who rejected Christ, to make room to graft in wild olive branches, those are the Gentiles. But if you're one of those grafted in wild olive branches, don't boast over the cut off original olive branches because God has the power to graft them in again. And when he does, how much better will they be suited to the tree because they were originally a part of it? Don't show, shoot me. This isn't me saying it. It's St. Paul. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, St. Paul finishes up explaining the logic of this. Um, so let me read the end of that chapter. Lest you be wise in your own conceits, I want you to understand this mystery, brethren. A hardening has come upon part of Israel until the full number of the Gentiles come in, and so all Israel will be saved. As regards the gospel, they are enemies of God, but for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. Okay? The Jews are enemies of God as regards the gospel. They reject the gospel, but that's for your sake. That's for the sake of the Gentiles. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. In other words, you know, the love of God through the election of Abraham still continues. Paul continues, for the gifts and the call of God are irrevocable. Just as you were once disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so they have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they may also receive mercy. For God has consigned all men to disobedience that he may have mercy upon all. Okay, so this is the logic of it. Think about that. If the Jews, uh, okay, um, before Christ, the Gentiles were disobedient, so to speak. They were out of relationship with God. So when they were brought into the church, they knew it was a sovereign gift of God. It was a sovereign grace of God. It was nothing they earned, this tremendous gift of salvation. But the Jews hadn't gone through a period of disobedience, right? They were in this relationship with God. If they had gone straight into the church, they would have felt, you know, we deserve this. You know, they would not have attributed to a free, sovereign gift of God, but they would have felt it was due to something they deserved. By passing through a period of disobedience, it becomes evident that their salvation, too, is a sovereign gift of mercy. This is exactly what Paul is saying, right? Um, uh, Just as you were once disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so they have now been disobedient, in order that by the mercy shown to you, they may also receive mercy. For God has consigned all men to disobedience, that he have, may, may have mercy upon all. It's logical, right? I know we've covered, you know, I mean, I've been racing through. But uh, anyway, so this is, this is, you know, this is basically, this is the whole picture. Um, um, the, um, I'll just close uh, with a little bit of an abrupt transition. The reason I'm doing all of this is primarily to encourage at least prayer for the conversion of the Jews, um, if not actual evangelization of the Jews. Now, the evangelization of the Jews, you know, I'm not talking about walking around with sandwich boards, but um, most Catholics, you know, have Jewish friends. Many actually have Jewish relatives, you know, or in-laws or, or, right? And, uh, or certainly co-workers and so forth. And Catholics tend to be shy about evangelizing. Um, they're, they're shy that they'll appear triumphalistic. They're shy that they will offend somebody. Now, without offending somebody, 
you can always be, uh, first of all, you can always pray for people's conversion, and you can always be ready to identify an opportunity presented by the Holy Spirit. Uh, because very often, I'll just give a little illustrative example. When Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ movie came out, I got an email from a Catholic woman who said her Jewish next-door neighbor had asked this Catholic woman, would you go to the Passion of the Christ movie with me so I have someone there who can explain it to me. This Catholic woman emailed me to ask me, am I allowed to do that? <laughs> right? So clearly, the opening was being presented, probably by the grace of God, probably by the Holy Spirit. It was probably God, you know, God welcoming this woman to open herself up to Christianity and the Catholic faith, and the Catholic kind of cloud over their shoulder, I don't want to offend anybody, was blocking that process. So, you know, if an opportunity arises, make use of that opportunity. Now, the best opportunity is just to let non-Catholics know what you have in the Catholic faith. Okay? In other words, you know, just let them know, for instance, if you show up to work happy because you just received communion and everyone else is glum, you know, and they say, why are you so, why do you look happy? Don't be shy about saying, because I just went to Mass and I just received the body, blood, soul, and divinity of God, you know? Well, who wouldn't be happy? Um, if, if you get bad news, you know, that you have a terminal illness and you're taking it more calmly than your coworker would ever expect you to take it, and they say, how come you're not, you know, more distraught? Um, you know, don't be shy about saying, you know, it's, it's because you know of the redemptive value of suffering, and you know what's awaiting you if you live well and if you die well, and you know that God's behind this, however unpleasant it may be. You know, just don't be shy about, about reflecting your faith, because that can't be offensive, and that can't, you know, that's not overbearing, but everybody will know it's the truth. I mean, people, you know, I know this from before my conversion, you know, you know it's true, you're blocking it out, you don't want to hear it, you don't want to admit it to yourself, but on some level, you know, it rings true. Uh, I'll just close in the 52 seconds I have left um, with um, Edith Stein's conversion. You all know Edith Stein. By the way, uh, one of my prayer cards. No, this is something that's free, so you can't accuse me, you know, of, of trying to peddle something. But one of the prayer cards I have um, here is of Edith Stein, and I'll close by reading the prayer on the back. But Edith Stein's conversion came about, the first stage, of a big first stage of her conversion, was she was visiting a friend of hers who was Christian, a young woman, tremendously in love with her young husband. The husband died in, in war, and Edith Stein went to visit her and console her. And Edith Stein couldn't understand why her friend, who had just lost her much beloved husband, was less distraught over her death, his death than she was. And she knew it had something to do with this woman's Christianity. And he, she knew it, there was a mystery there that someday she would have to penetrate. Okay? That's the perfect example. You know, and that's the ultimate means of evangelization. Um, so anyway, I will close with this prayer that's on the back of this uh, prayer card, which is a prayer for the conversion of the Jews. Um, you know, church approved. It was a postulatum at the First Vatican Council. Okay, postulatum is just Latin for petition. It was uh, heartily endorsed by the Pope of the Council, Pope Pius IX. It was signed by virtually all of the Council Fathers. And it was an invitation to the Jews to enter the Church. Because what's happened, unfortunately, is that especially since the Holocaust, everyone has gotten very shy about evangelizing the Jews and very shy about praying for the conversion of the Jews. And you, most of you know about the brouhaha when Pope Benedict XVI reintroduced um, the Tridentine Liturgy for Good Friday and the, the more, the more, um, bl the blunter prayer for the conversion of the Jews and so forth. But let me read this prayer for the conversion of the Jews from the First Vatican Council, let's see, 1860s. I'm inviting you to silently pray along, and I, I will, it's on the back of about half of these prayer cards. Um, I'll have plenty down there for anyone who wants them. The undersigned fathers of the Council humbly yet urgently pray that the Holy Ecumenical Council of the Vatican come to the aid of the unfortunate nation of Israel with an entirely paternal invitation that finally exhausted by weight no less futile than long, the Israelites hasten to recognize the Messiah, our Savior Jesus Christ, truly promised to Abraham and announced by Moses, thus completing and crowning, not changing the Mosaic religion. The undersigned fathers have the very firm confidence that the Holy Council will have compassion on the Israelites because they are always very dear to God on account of their fathers, 
and because it is from them that the Christ was born according to the flesh. Would that they then speedily acclaim the Christ, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David, blessed be he who comes in the name of the Lord, comes in the name of the Lord. Would that they hurl themselves into the arms of the Immaculate Virgin Mary, even now their sister according to the flesh, who wishes likewise to be their mother according to grace, as she is ours. Amen. Amen. Thank you.